Let's get right into it as there's plenty to review this week. First off, the Rust Core Utilities are claiming performance gains over the GNU Core Utilities. In the recent Rust Core Utilities 0.1 release, the team is excited to announce the release of the first 0.1 milestone. What they claim in this release is it brings major performance gains, SC Linux support, and an expanded GNU compatibility. Let's talk about these highlights. SE Linux now supports integration of the copy list, make directory, and more commands, and continuous integration testing is now live. There's also performance improvements and notable speed ups for, for concatenation, listing, tail, sequencing, and more that now match or exceed the GNU core utilities performance. This is an interesting one as they're claiming there are some speed boosts and another big announcement, which is Ubuntu plans on shipping with the Rust Core Utilities package, which is the first sign of a major distribution beginning to integrate the Rust Core Utilities into their base system. This latest release also has 40 newcomers, 60 plus contributors now, and 843 commits. All a big deal as we're seeing more and more coverage of all the tools that are in the new Core Utilities as the test suite compatibility now brings coverage to around 84.4% of all tools that exist in the GNU core utilities can also be ran through the Rust core utilities. This is all good, but the bigger claim was performance improvements in tools, including CAT. As we can see here, it says improved performance of formatting, formatting performance improvement. Sounds like the same thing again. Either way, performance improvement when printing line numbers. So what kind of improvements are we seeing? As I'm not gonna get into these improvements too much, but for example here, in the formatting performance improvement, we see Again, on very specific targets, concatenating some wiki data from an XML file. And when they ran that, it was 1.5 to 1.6 times faster than the original concatenation using the new core utilities. It is exciting to see these gains. Of course, you're going to see this as things are being rewritten in Rust and there's an opportunity to optimize them. Let me know what you think about Ubuntu going over to the Rust core utilities, starting with the next release. But let's get over to talking about this week in GNOME, as we've seen some exciting updates. As the GNOME core apps and libraries have received an update, and one of the bigger ones is the web browser Epiphany, or just called WebNow. Web has gained a preference page that allows toggling for WebKit features at runtime. Tech preview builds of the browser will show the setting page by default. This should allow front end developers to test upcoming features more easily, which is exciting for developers now. We have the ability to turn on and off WebKit features in the features panel. I want to speak more on GNOME as they need your help specifically. As posted on GNOME's discourse forum, they're calling for help. The GNOME release team is seeking volunteers to help revive the GNOME help, what they called Yelp, which is not actively maintained and has out-of-date documentation. Yelp is what they call bit rotting, the default help viewer still uses GTK3 and hasn't been ported to Mason and recently suffered a serious security flaw. Again, it has no active maintainer. Also, the existing documentation is written in Mallard, which is a niche format that relies on its own tooling and has not been actively maintained. They spell out what is needed as they would like to pass over the existing documentation and fix it up, at least in the most outdated bits. Longer term, we need to think about replacing the documentation format and tooling. If you have experience in this area, your contribution could make a real difference. You can imagine without a engaged documentations team, new features go undocumented and existing guides are going to fall further behind. That's why the GNOME team is asking for people to join in and try to help GNOME with this major ongoing issue. This matters to Linux as people using GNOME are not going to get a good onboarding or support experience without properly documentation for troubleshooting everyday tasks. Also, as we can tell, they already have some security and stability issues since Yelp relies on web technologies that can and will produce CVEs because they're outdated. And this is a perfect opportunity for someone who doesn't write code because the majority of the work is writing. GNOME help and user guides are written in Mallard XML still which is more like HTML than actual coding. You don't necessarily need to know how to build software. You just need to explain how to use it. This is more about clarity, structure, and an understanding of software than it is actual development or engineering. You can also have a massive impact with this. So I'm just letting everyone know that the release team from GNOME is looking for help. Moving on to KDE Plasma. We're seeing cool updates this week. And the major one is that 
time of day wallpapers. You can now set, as you see in the red, to automatically switch your desktop background based on the time of day. As we keep getting nice tweaks in one of the favorite desktop environments, they're always focused on great work here. We also see some UI polish or improvements with Plasma 6.4. Discover no longer includes wallpapers and other add-ons in its search results unless you initiate the search while on the add-ons page. This should make most search results even more relevant. Fantastic. Also a few rounds of visual polish on the audio volume widget, which can get quite complicated looking when multiple devices are present. And we can see here the division that they've made with the output devices versus the input devices, and then a nice division between the multiple devices that are available. I do like the look of this. I also enjoy the fact that they're constantly updating the UI. They never think that they're perfect, which is another great Thing from this team. Plasma 6.5 made a major UI improvement with the sticky note widget to support the use case of having it integrated into your panel. Now you can resize them and make them much smaller, change the background color from the context menu and choose the transparent background color. And we can see a selection for transparency or how it looks with the current note selected. Other notable fixes, several KWIN crash bugs were squashed this round. The X Wayland screen selection issue has been fixed and rear lock screen bypass vulnerability has been closed. Also, the adaptive sync has been disabled by default due to widespread graphics driver glitches. 6.4 has now shipped with adaptive sync turned off by default. But now I wanna briefly talk about both GNOME and KDE as they are focusing on supplying a Wayland only desktop experience. I go much more into depth about this in a previous video that I posted last week. If you want to check out how GNOME and Fedora plan on shipping with Wayland only modes, you'll definitely want to check out that video as Wayland is really taking over the desktop environment. As the GNOME desktop recently calls for the disable of the XORG session by default, as they call this the first step towards deprecating the X11 session, and Fedora has done the same. Fedora plans on changing to Wayland only GNOME. And you can see that these two teams are working together to really try to pull X11 packages and session management completely out of their desktop and distribution. As this Fedora change was accepted to remove the GNOME X11 packages from the Fedora repositories. All users of the GNOME X11 session will be migrated to the GNOME Wayland session. Again, if you wanna get more in depth with this one. I'll post the link in the description below so you can check out my other video on this. I'm not getting into depth, but things are definitely changing. Before we get to more exciting news, I want you to take a moment and subscribe below. You wouldn't want to miss another video like this. YouTube can get finicky. Also, make sure to smash that like button on the way back up. Let's talk about a massive commit of nearly 62,000 lines that were patched by Microsoft. Mesa just received this patch. Mesa is an open source implementation of key graphics APIs, including things like OpenGL, OpenGL ES, Vulkan, and others. This pretty much provides Linux and other Unix-like systems the 3D plumbing that it needs to help render graphics as it gives GPUs compatibilities for tuning standardized API calls into fast hardware accelerated operations that can pretty much help power everything from desktop effects to 3D gaming. What's interesting about this one, you can see that John here from Microsoft.com merged a massive patch. You can see all the commits, everything in green means the lines have been added and there has been tens of thousands of lines added. Specifically, we've seen around 61,925 insertions, two deletions and 115 files changed. Microsoft recently upstreamed this massive patch to Mesa 25.2, a new patch in development that introduces the new Gallium 3D front end called MFT, the Media Foundation Transforms, which hooks up Microsoft's D3, D12 Gallium driver into Mesa's pipe interface. This front end implements asynchronous media decoding and encoding transformations on top of D3, D12. This is gonna let applications use hardware accelerated video processing via Microsoft's Media Foundation with Mesa. Why does this matter to Linux? Well, it strengthens WSL parity with graphics by enhancing the Mesa stack on Windows. WSL gains more complete hardware accelerated media support 
that mirrors native Linux behavior. Also, it boosts vendor engagement on open graphics. This better tooling is gonna get more eyes on the code and a means for faster bug fixes, especially with WSL being open source this week. If their primary focus here is trying to help WSL with improved hardware accelerated graphics support, could it be that Microsoft wants WSL to keep benefiting from open source? I believe so. Let me know what you think. Either way, this also lays the groundwork for cross compatible platforms and media pipelines. Even though that the MFT front end is Windows focused, the Gallium 3D pipeline interface is platform agnostic, meaning it doesn't care about platforms and future work hopefully can adapt similar asynchronous transformation frameworks for things like VA API or video for Linux, which hopefully will improve media processing for desktops and servers especially in low latency situations. In short, hopefully we see some ripple effects in Linux, even though this is a Microsoft Windows based improvement. Overall, I do think it makes Mesa stronger for all Linux users. Quite exciting. What's not exciting is Mozilla is saying bye to Pocket and to describe everything that's happening in a blog post, because as of July 8th, 2025, Mozilla made the difficult decision to shut down Pocket. Pocket was a popular read it later service that allows users to save articles, videos, and web pages so they can view them later across various devices. Originally launched in 2007 as read it later, it was rebranded as Pocket in 2012 and acquired by Mozilla in 2017. If you are using Pocket, this article explains everything you need to know, including how to save your content, get a refund if you're a premium user, and what to expect next. There's a lot to this, but I'm going to quickly go through some of the important information, including the shutdown date. Again, July 8th, 2025 is the planned shutdown. The export window is gonna go through October 8th, 2025. Account deletion will take place also on October 8th, 2025. And when it comes to premium refunds, monthly plans, auto renewals will stop immediately and you can keep the benefits through the paid month. Also annual plans on July 8th, 2025 will receive a prorated refund to your original payment method. Pocket extensions and new application installs are already disabled as of May 22nd, 2025. And after July 8th, extensions will switch to export only mode and have to be manually removed. API users, all read and write access via the Pocket API ends on October 8th, 2025. So export your data beforehand. And finally, they break down key dates at the very end. I'm gonna post a link in the description below so you can check this out, especially if you're using Pocket. Make sure to check this out. You wouldn't wanna lose everything that you've saved on October 8th. Good luck out there. Now let's talk Wayland support through the eyes of NVIDIA and what's actually missing. These are features that are not supported on Wayland or the X Wayland protocols as NVIDIA announces the current limitations, at least as of the 575 release series. This is interesting as we get a look into the graphics side of Wayland and what NVIDIA needs for it to actually be successful as there are features that are not supported using Wayland or X Wayland and NVIDIA is now making a blog post seemingly every decade, which just means from 565 release series to the 575 release series, they're making updates. Not much has changed between the two series, but what's not supported is stereo rendering via GLX, EGL, or Vulkan as mentioned right here. Also the implicit SLI mosaic. So tiling a single virtual display across multiple monitors. Also the Nvidia settings will not offer the same level of configuration. On X11, Nvidia settings can reconfigure displays on the fly. Under Wayland, there's no cross compositor mechanism for that. So you only get system info and power usage reporting. Then they detail some features that are only available through Vulkan Direct or Display, which include things like stereo rendering, Vulkan Illicit SLI, swap groups, and frame lock and gen lock. Things that are planned for future releases. They want display mux switching, the automatic GPU display switching on laptops, advanced pipeline controls, including warp and blend, pixel shift, color encoding, range options, the NVIDIA DRM presentation timing, VDPAU and VGPU support on Wayland, which sheds a light because since Wayland compositors do not cover all of NVIDIA's legacy X11 hooks, some workstation grade features are not available on the Wayland compositor at all. And as the ecosystem matures, 
NVIDIA is going to try and fill these gaps, but some of them are not going to be able to be filled. This is simply because X11 and Wayland treat their protocols very differently with different layers of access through the protocol. We'll keep checking in and seeing how things develop over time. Will NVIDIA get better on Wayland? I personally use an NVIDIA graphics card and haven't had too much trouble using Linux with Wayland, but there are clearly gaps. Well, we covered a lot this week in Linux and open source news. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to smash that like button to get it out to more people. Also subscribe below. You wouldn't want to miss another one like this. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.